whole impetus for going on the road with with the Mad Dogs show was coming from Leon, essentially. Was that am I right? Well, Joe had booked a tour, or D. Anthony had booked a tour, uh, an extensive tour in the United States. And Joe had just come off of a tour in England. He would come to the United States and really, I know he felt like he was going to be able to just kick back and get some rest. And we, it was five, six days before the tour started, and D'Anthony said, no, this is not a time to rest. If you don't do these dates, you'll never work in the United States again. And Joe, at that time, the band was gone. Chris Stanton was still with him. <clears throat> so he kind of, he knew Denny Cordell and he kind of reached out to Denny and Leon uh, and, and Leon came on board and said, I'll put the band together, I'll do the arrangements, the tour will go forward, but I have to make all the decisions. And at that time, I think Joe felt like not, that was not such a bad thing because he really was exhausted. And to be able to turn it over to Leon, I don't think that he really realized that everything was going to be out of his control. That he simply was the guy that walked to the center of the stage and sang the songs. He didn't have anything to do with the arrangements or, or the choice of musicians or choir or and ultimately the filming of the tour. I'm sure that he said yes, whatever, you know, but I, uh, I think that he really just sat back and watched this circus come alive around him. And he never, in my mind, Joe never, the only time he really fit in was when he walked to the center of the stage and commanded that stage because he was so, he had such raw, incredible, God-given talent. And when, that, when he was in the center of the stage, I saw nobody else. There was only Joe, and I think the audiences saw it that way as well. I mean, preferably, Joe would have been a part of the planning. He would have been m more a part of the musical arrangements, everything else. I think he would have preferred to have been more a part of it, but that was not the agreement that he had reached with Leon. And Leon was the kind of person, for instance, as we drove cross-country, he never got out of the car. He never dealt with a single person because he had this long beard and we're driving across Texas and he's totally paranoid. So we got to California, Leon walked in the house and shaved the beard off and I often wondered why he didn't do that before we drove across Texas, but I think he still would have probably scared some people because he had the long hair and he was, uh, he was definitely unique. Leon is a, a massive talent. His, um, just his history and the music that he grew up listening to and, and the struggles that he overcame to be a musician and to be in the spotlight, I think were tremendous because deep inside, Leon always battled with being kind of an introvert and uh, kind of live in seclusion or to be the, the ringmaster. There was no in-between. And, uh, and the Joe Carter tour asked of him to be the ringmaster. And that's, I think that's the reason Leon did it the way he did, because there was no in-between. So I think that when he, when he came to Joe and presented him with that, that was, uh, I think it was in a sense a huge sacrifice for Leon, although it may not appear that way. Because for him, it meant coming out of that, coming out of this, uh, out of seclusion and being on stage every night and commanding this band and really setting the tone for the way everyday life was. I mean, he brought all of these extra people, all of these women, and all of these kind of hangers-on people who Leon, I think, in the picture saw how they would fit into the circus. I didn't at first, and maybe I still don't, but there were some wackos and there were some lovely people that couldn't sing a note or play a note, but they were part of the, part of the circle. And there's, uh, the circle seems to be a, a sort of symbolic 
moment. Nearly, was it every day where people would gather together in a circle? Every, before every show, we gathered in a circle and we held hands and we closed our eyes. Sometimes it was a silent prayer and sometimes the, it was on a vocal level, but we always joined hands and came together. And I thought that was re really beautiful. And on, on the picnic, um, when we got to Oklahoma in the film, you, it was really a beautiful afternoon. And at the end of that afternoon, again, we gathered in, in the circle. So there were, there were so many parts of the tour that were just really beautiful and, and uh, free and whimsical and wonderful. And there were other parts of the tour that just were almost too hard to, to even bear to get through. But we all, we all did. Did you feel like leaving at any stage? Oh, I felt like leaving um, probably after the first two weeks. I wanted to leave all the time. I would sit with Joe on the plane a lot of nights. And I would say, Joe, and usually it's when I was trying to step out of the picture because I had just graduated from college. <clears throat> I had just graduated from college and was pretty naive about the world of rock and roll on the level that I was seeing it on the Joe Cocker tour. And I would slip into the seat next to Joe and, you know, we'd, we would talk quietly for a minute and I'd say, Joe, I don't think I can do this anymore. I was losing weight. I felt like my health was was declining, you know. I mean, I'm 22 years old. And Joe would say, you can't leave me, love. You're the only friend I've got. And I really did feel that was, I felt that that was really true to him uh, so much of the time. That sounds quite sad in the sense that, what, looking back, you know, the tour had a big kind of impact historically. People refer to it, they see the film and so on. But, um, and Joe is the center of that. But no, hearing what you say, it's like he was carrying around this kind of inner unhappiness about being there. Well, Joe was, he was only the center, really, when the, when the lights were on and when the, when, the, when the stage lit up and we were all on stage. And then there were always people, you know, again, clamoring to get to Joe uh, for whatever reasons, just to touch him, just, you know, not, not our group, but outsiders who would jump on, you know, some of the groupies like the Butter Queen who was with us for a while. And, uh, I mean, there were all, all these really strange people that would try to get to Joe, and he just always had that little, hey, <laughs> that little laugh and that little smile of his and his eyes would roll back in his head and, and he would be, I would feel he, like he just didn't know what the heck was going on. How do I get out of here? Where's the door? <laughs> um, what was in your mind when you heard about this extraordinary venture to get all these people together? Uh, and, I, and I believe you came here initially to rehearse the whole thing, right? We did. We rehearsed on this lot right here, A and M. Um, I think that it, as every all the pieces started coming into the into the picture, all the people and Leon's working on musicians, and I'm working on some singers, and he's letting me know that this person's going to do it, and that person, and I'm can I bring Donna Weiss? Can you know? And how many people can I bring in? How many do you have? There can't be too many. I mean, you may have noticed that there were, what, three or four drummers. And Joe, before the tour, Joe said, do we really need four drummers? And Leon said, well, which three are you going to fire? <laughs> so as it turned out, it did work out fine because there was an awful lot of music coming off of that stage. And everybody played so well together. I mean, even Sandy Konikoff, who was is tremendous percussionist and Chuck Blackwell and Jimmy Keltner and Jim Gordon. I mean, you wouldn't think that that many drummers would be able to work together, but somehow or other, Leon, the ringmaster, kept it all at, at, at balanced. And um, 
so when we when we began the rehearsals i think we literally had four days of rehearsals before we had to pack and just be at a and m at the crack of dawn and we rehearsed eight probably 18 hours a day we would rehearse and sing and we had so much music to learn and just over and over and over for four days and for a lot of people that would seem like such a minimal amount of rehearsal for a tour of that scale. But in fact, when Jerry and, and Herb Albert came in and saw what was going on at the rehearsals, that the, the filming part was kind of the afterthought. They came in and said, this is just too huge. This is something that's, gonna, that's different from anything that's ever happened. And we've got to film this. And then they start pulling in the film crew and suddenly, instead of you know twenty-five people, there are fifty people, and it just kept growing right up to the minute we got on the plane. And there were different numbers of people on the plane at, at night. There were more people than there were seats. There would be people in the floor <laughs> sleeping, <laughs> and um, but the the rehearsals were they were nonstop. And they, I think that as the music was born and being created and the arrangements coming, being formed and being played, you know, just the excitement among the, the singers and the musicians just grew. And there were nights when the half of us couldn't sing. We didn't have any voices left. But we're again there doing our best and, you know, picking up the slack for anybody that couldn't sing that night. And it's amazing that we were even able to do the first show after that schedule. I think we were exhausted the first week just from the rehearsals. And people would wander in, um, like Pamela Polland, I think, just wandered in to one of the rehearsals one night um, and just thought, wow, I think I'd like to, I think I'd like to sing on this. And she, she became one of the singers said, come on over, join the crowd, we'll, you know, throw it in and <laughs> see if it works. And, and that's how it just kept growing and growing. And then there were all the people, wives and friends and girlfriends, who were not singers, who were on the microphone. So actually, when we got back to Los Angeles, I went in the studio with Glenn Johns, and who's a famous British engineer, wonderful, and good friend at the time. And we went in the studio and brought in the Blackberries and a few other singers and had to lay down tracks that were, not not all of them are just background, professional background singers, but we had to mix them in with the singing that was going on because some of it, not being singers, sounded pretty ratty. And that was that just couldn't happen around Joe, because he was pitch perfect and spot on all the time. <laughs> so we had to bring it up to the level of his excellence there, and make it sound the way it looked. Well, that's fascinating, because uh, I think Joe was a little disappointed in the uh, recordings from, um, you know, the initial kind of I guess demo recordings that he heard. So obviously that sort of input with Glenn Johns must have made all the difference. I think it made a big difference because the background vocals are so, they're so dominant on the record. I mean, they're, they're up there. They're mixed way up, which is the way, the way background vocals were mixed at that time. And there are times where we're singing counter, counterparts with him and so it had to be right. It definitely had to be right because the musicians were just impeccable. Plus, I mean, the, the, the scale of it, the fact that it was four days to do this, um, that must have seemed crazy to you at the time. It seemed crazy to me now. <laughs> it seemed crazy then, and it seems crazy now that we were able to accomplish what we did in four days. We didn't, we didn't get much food, we didn't get much sleep, but we were 20. I mean, there was nobody in that tour, I don't think over 26 years old, 
27 years old, we were all just children. That's pretty amazing as well. There was no one, you know, no producer, I mean, Danny Cordell or, or someone wasn't saying, there has to be a limit to the numbers, there has to be a limit to the amount of people we can take, I mean, how we are going to get them all around the country. No questions about that. Well, I think there did reach a point in the rehearsals when, you know, when we had to, to there was a cutoff, to, cutoff time because you can't just continue to bring people in and try to teach them an entire show. And we, we did get on the road and perform immediately two days after we finished rehearsing. So it, there was a time where, you know, where we, we had our, the groups around the microphone, around each microphone according to parts and blends, and when we had gotten that done, and then the, the, that, that was the end of it. But it didn't stop the girlfriends and the wives and the hangers-on from jumping behind those microphones. So technically in rehearsal, it sounded great, and as the concerts went on, and more people just kept jumping up on the stage and just, you know, leaning in so they could be in the movie, that it got to be pretty ragged. <laughs> of course Joe had to feel overwhelmed. I mean, not only with the body of music and arrangements that everybody had to learn in such a short period of time, but then there was the element of not, it not being his, feeling like it was his show, not feeling like he had control, and it wasn't like he, you know, he would stop and say, "Wait a minute, I don't like, you know, I don't like this part here. Let's shorten this." He just kind of went with the flow. Leon might do that because he was the musical f f master, but uh, but I, Joe just pretty much like the rest of us was. Um, just following the leader and hoping that it was all going to be okay. The incredible thing is his stamina to go through that, the tour, the whole tour. Um, but am I right that it, that it essentially just burnt him out because he goes back home to Sheffield and disappears for a while? Well, Joe... Joe was exhausted when the tour started from having just come from England. He was really tired, and I don't know, probably because we were so young and people just expected that, you know, that you could just go and go and go and go, but it, that's not really the case. And I think that Joe was tired when the tour started, and I think he was running on borrowed time a lot of that tour. Um, and when the tour was over, he actually was went to Denny Cordell's house and was staying there for a while, and actually sleeping by the front door. He didn't have a place to live. He didn't have enough money to even buy a guitar. He walked into Jerry Moss's office and and said, "I'd like to have a guitar, and I don't I don't have any money." So they bought him a guitar. I would go and pick him up at Joe at. Denny's house, he would call and he'd say, I'd say, are you okay? And he'd say, well, I'm, yeah, I'm okay, love. I'm, I'm sleeping on the floor at Denny's house. And I'd say, okay, I'm coming to get you. And I would pick him up and take him over. I was living with my sister Priscilla and her husband Booker T at the time. And I would take Joe over to the house and, you know, get him some food. I would cook for him for two or three days. And and we would just hang out and rest and watch TV and not do anything and not drink and just get clean and get feel a little bit of his strength coming back. And he'd say, okay, I think I, think I probably need to go back. And I would take him back over to Denny's and it would be maybe a week or two, I'd get the phone call again. So there I still was, Mama Rita. <laughs> Taking care of him until he until he did go back to Sheffield. Did you did you cook him shepherd's pie? I didn't know how. I made him beans and cornbread, and he he didn't seem to um, he didn't seem to mind any of the food that I cooked. I cooked a lot, still do. <laughs> made a lot of tea, cooked a lot of beans. <laughs> so it's. Uh, I don't know, was he being 
played by the record company? Was he being, you know, this guy's just done this massive tour that's like absolutely huge, uh, and yet he doesn't have the money to buy a guitar. What, what was going on there? Well, if you look at the, this is after the tour. I mean, before anything is, before the record is out, before anything is out. And, and you look at the number of people on the road with the film crew, the cost of the film crew, the cost of, uh, of 50 people and salaries and hotel rooms and per diems. I mean, I'm surprised that they could even make, the, make those costs. It didn't surprise me that there was no money left at the end of that tour because we were, it, was, it was all the time. And we weren't playing stadiums. We were playing Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. We were playing colleges. We weren't playing huge venues. You know, the biggest crowds that we had were maybe a thousand people. And some of them were even smaller than that. So, it was, and the tickets weren't expensive. This is still back, you know, 1969. So, it, there, there was really no way that, that anybody could have come out of that with money. Leon didn't come out. With money, none of us did. You know, we were just hand to mouth. There, there's uh, in the account in uh, the, Joe's biography, the uh, the villain is named as De Anthony. As, as he the was the manager. Yeah, if anybody came out, it was De Anthony. <laughs> uh, was that the feeling you had? That, that uh, maybe it shouldn't. Obviously, it's great for history that that sh that show took off and went on the road, and that there's the the record in the film. You know, it's very exciting for all of us fans. But was it a bad step for Joe in his career to be pushed so hard, so far? You know, that that early in his career. Well, I don't. Who can say whether it's good or bad? Because what came up, what came of that, what came from that. And, you know, really kind of, in my mind, it really started with D. Anthony's really using fear tactics on Joe. I mean, he wasn't just saying, you're never going to work in the United States again. He was saying, people's legs are going to get broken. These contracts are signed. The, the venues are booked. The tickets are sold. You have to do this. And if you don't, and so, you know, and, and the implied part of that was that somebody was going to hurt him. And I, I, I can't imagine how Joe must have felt. This is his manager talking to him, the guy that's supposed to be helping him and building his career and looking out for him. And maybe he, Dee was just stating what he felt might happen but to me, it wasn't coming from a, a warm and fuzzy place. I mean, I think that fear is really a bad, bad uh, energy to run on, and I know that it did start that way. And I don't know that it ever went away, especially at the end of the tour when he had just literally given all of himself, and there was nothing to show for it right after the tour. I think it did do a... Uh, it made a lot of people happy, a lot of, and built a huge fan base in this country that might have been there eventually, but it wouldn't have happened that fast. So I think in those periods after the tour when Joe would come over and we would just hang out and sleep, watch TV, eat, just do nothing, and, you know, we would talk about uh, talk about that and what what sacrifice um, was it worth it and I I think that by the end of those four or five days he would feel like it had been worth it but he still kind of seemed lost and didn't know what his next move was going to be and ultimately he did go back home and didn't sing again before people until I was in Sheffield a year later and he came out and and got up and sang with my band, and we sang a song together, and I was opening for the birds, and Roger McGuinn was on the side of the stage as Joe is being welcomed back on stage in his hometown in Sheffield, 
And the people were going crazy. And Roger McGuinn is on the side of the stage going like this to me. It's like, get him off, your time's up. Get him off. And I was like, what are you going to do? <laughs> and uh, I think it felt, I think it really did feel good to Joe to be back out there singing because I had a dynamite band and everybody was so excited. I I'm, felt kind of bad for the birds that night because because <laughs> they, as good as they were, nothing could, that's a really hard act to follow. Not me, Joe. In Sheffield. In Sheffield. Do you think, um, was that something that really gave him the impetus uh, to get back up, back to the States and do some more recording? I do. I do think it was because he hadn't done anything. And, I, and I'm sure in those months that he was in Sheffield and just at home trying to recuperate, I'm sure that he, he may have looked back on the tour and, and thought, uh, is this what I want to do? Is this what I want my life to be like? So hopefully, you know, there was a, gave him a little bit of push by coming out and uh, singing with me in the Dixie Flyers. <laughs>